So these are the zermelo frankel axioms. This is the, the foundational agreed-upon axiomatic system for almost everything that we're doing in mathematics. So let's take a look at what do these axioms state. Because remember, so an axiom, what we're saying is that this is just something that we're just going to believe is true. We don't have the ability to prove them, but we're just going to assume that they are true. And hopefully they're just obvious enough. Okay, so this first one, axiom of extensionality. Two, two sets are equal if and only if they have the same elements. So this set, or this axiom hopefully makes perfect sense when we're saying if we have the set A, which is the set containing one and two, and we have B, this is the set containing one and two, hopefully we now see that A is equal to B. So these two sets are equal because they have the same elements. Okay, that one seems to be pretty clear. Axiom of the power set. If we have a set, then the collection of all of its subsets is another set. So remember, the power set we've been working with, it's the ability to form a power set of a set, and this is of any set, then this is the, the axiom that we have. So as long as we have a set, we're allowed to create a power set. So in this case, we indeed have the power set of A. In this case, would be the set containing uh, 1, 2, the empty set, oops, sorry, these are the set containing one, the set containing two, and the set containing one and two. So it is the set where all of these, these four elements, these are all the subsets of the set A. Now, a few things that we should note, though, is that when we talk about the axiom of the power set, we have the power set of a, a set. We've been looking at finite sets. What if we look at an infinite set? So we talked about the power set of the natural numbers. Now, this is a set where if you were to try to create all of the elements in this set, you'd be like, oh, yes, it's the set containing one, and it's the set containing two, and all these other ones. And it's also the set containing one and two, and it's also the set containing one, five, and ten, and a whole bunch of things. And also, obviously, you have the empty sense, the whole set itself. So the when you start to try to create these, it's a little bit ugly. So having just basically the existence of this power set is a really nice axiom to have, that it always exists. There's always this thing that works. Axiom of union. So if we have a set of sets I, then we have a set U, which is the union of those sets. Namely, all the elements of I are subsets of U, and U is the smallest possible set with this property. So this is – so as a note, some of these I've really tried to simplify the formal expressions for these. This one I left a little bit more of the, the fancy uh, words that are used for these axioms. So what this means is let's say I have a set I, which consists of the set 1, 2, and 3, and I also have the set containing 4, 5, and 6. What this U is going to be defined as is this is going to be a set where the elements of I are going to be subsets of these. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So what we formed here is this is a way to describe the union, but in a very different way. We're basically essentially forming the union of these two sets, but we're using the set to discuss this. So we have a set containing these individual sets. Cool, but we can form unions. That's good. Axiom of regularity. In each, in every set X, which is non-empty, there's an element Y which does not have any elements shared with X. So this one, now it's a little bit weird. Every set, there's an element that does not have any elements shared with X. So for instance, if we have some set X here, and we have, say, 1, 2, and the set containing 5. There is an element that does not have any elements shared with x. So this would be an example now where this is a set that does not share any elements with x. But you're like, well, wait a minute. What about if you have the set containing 1, 2, and the set containing 1? Well, this set here... This would be, this is an element of the set X, but it does not have any elements shared with X. Well, it does that there, 
this this set Y does have one. But on the other hand, we wouldn't take this to be our Y. We would instead take, say, this to be our Y. This is now something that this is an element that does not have any elements shared with X. All right. So basically, this allows us to not have weird a set is defined within a set. And that's defined within another set, which is defined another set, and have this like infinite weird sets inside other sets. All right. Axiom of pairing. Given two sets, there's a set whose elements are exactly the two given sets. So what that means is if we have, say, the set A, which is the set containing one, and B is the set containing one or containing two, then I can form a new set that consists of combining these two sets within it. So if you think about this axiom of union up here, often people think about something called flattening. So you are flattening. So you're taking these the set containing sets and you're basically getting rid of the sets within it. But here, this is gonna be the opposite where now we take two sets and now we form a set with more sets in there. Axiom of replacement, we can describe a function whose domain is a set, then its image is a set. So as long as we can define a function whose domain is a set, then the image is. So as long as we have x, then we also have f of x as a new set. Cool. So we're allowed to define functions and images within that. Axiom of specification, given any set A, an open proposition P of x defined on the set A, the collection of all the elements of A that satisfy P of x is a set. All right, so this one, again, this one's a little bit weird, but we're basically saying that if we have propositions, so remember, we're saying that this is going to be this P of X, this would be, say, X is five feet tall or something, and then you're taking a collection of people that satisfy that. So this is way back to the beginning of logic. We describe these propositions with P of X, X being this variable. Then what we're defining, though, is everything that fits within this proposition forms a new set. All right. Axiom of, in of infinity, there exists an infinite set. Now, this one, you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought we proved that there was an infinite set, right? Because we, we did prove, right, that the, the natural numbers is infinite. If you remember, we did that proof and we did a contradiction. But this is, we could do that contradiction because of this axiom that allowed us to even describe what does it even mean to be an infinite set. For you to have the possibility of a contradiction, you need to have something else that could exist. So this was hidden behind the scenes, and there's actually mathematicians who don't believe in this. They're, they're called finitists, and they're like, nothing is actually infinite, and they math is a lot harder for them. So <laughs> don't become a finitist. Imagine that there is an infinite set. And then this last one, the axiom of choice here, given any collection of non-empty sets, it's possible to select one element from each set. Okay, so this one also, right? So if I have a collection of non-empty sets, if I have, say, the set containing X, the set containing Y, I have the set containing uh, 3, 5, and the set containing um, 7, 4, and the empty set. It's possible to select one element from each set. So I, there's an element, I can pick an element, I can pick an element, I can pick an element. And here I go, I could now pick one element. So there's this, like, choice within each of the sets. So when we look at these set, or all of these axioms, a lot of these have a lot of hopefully natural intuition and things that we hope that we'd be able to do mathematically because we've been doing them all semester. Like this idea of talking about two sets being equal, they have the same elements, forming unions of sets, these things, talking about images of sets, we've been doing them for quite a while. But... One of these is extremely controversial. This axiom of choice down here, this is a super, super controversial axiom. And so often people will actually just talk about these axioms as the zermelo frankel axioms and then throw in the axiom of choice sometimes or sometimes without. So I will create a new video that discusses why is the axiom of choice so controversial? Why, even though it seems to be intuitive, why is it actually the most controversial one in which mathematicians will absolutely say, I do not believe this and other mathematicians don't think they're crazy.